X Talks connects professionals in the life science, medical device, and food industries with useful content like webinars, job openings, articles, and virtual meetings to help you succeed in your career. This food industry focused podcast brings together some of our editorial staff to share insights into the latest B2B industry news to help keep you up to date. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the X Talks Food Podcast. I'm Sydney Perlmutter, Senior Food Industry Journalist and Webinar Moderator at XTalks.com, and this week I'm joined by Aisha Rashid and Vera Kovacevic. Thanks for coming today. So I'm going to start us off with a story about yet another 3D printed food, and this time it is fish. So Stakeholder Foods is marking a pivotal moment in the seafood industry with its latest innovation, 3D printed fish in the form of plant-based shrimp. Now, this breakthrough developed by a leader in cultivated meat and 3D bioprinting technology is set to transform the $60 billion shrimp market. The company's use of cutting edge technology not only showcases a technological triumph, but also uh, positions itself as a major disruptor in the seafood industry. So um, the CEO of Stakeholder Food said in a press release, by unveiling a second new species of plant-based 3D printed seafood this month, we expect to position Stakeholder Foods to sell and deliver its first drop jet printer in 2024, offering partners and customers a unique opportunity to benefit from the expanding global seafood market while making the right kind of impact on the environment. And I'll get to what that drop jet printer is in just a sec. So Stakeholder Foods has leveraged its unique drop jet printer, which is a marvel in 3D printing technology specifically designed for creating fish and seafood products. Now, the plant-based shrimp are produced using a specialized shrimp-flavored ink created by the company's expert food tech team. This innovation accurately emulates the taste and texture of traditional shrimp, offering an unmatched culinary experience. Now, the significance of this technology is is quite immense. Considering the massive global shrimp harvest, which is over 7.6 million tons in 2023, stakeholder foods approach is timely and vital. The company's advanced printing solutions aims to meet the soaring demand with a focus on high volume, efficient and sustainable production. And this method represents a major step forward in addressing global challenges like food security, carbon footprint reduction and the conservation of crucial resources resources like water and land. Now, a little more about Stakeholder Foods. It's headquartered in Rehovot, Israel, and it's been a front runner in the cultured meat revolution since 2019. And a couple years ago, I wrote about its um, 3D bioprinted steak as well. So this is not the first of its products by any means. Now, the company's mission is deeply rooted in providing slaughter-free cell agriculture meat products, including beef and seafood. So um, just like just like cultured meat meat except they print it. Um, now it the company aligns with the UN sustainable development goals and it's committed to a more sustainable and responsible global food system offering viable alternatives to traditional farming and fishing methods. But in the expanding realm of 3D printed fish, stakeholder foods faces increasing competition. Yes, even for how niche it is, it still does have some competitors. There are several companies, including Plantish and Wild Type, that are delving into lab grown seafood, focusing on species like tuna and salmon. And New Wave Foods also offers plant based shrimp, but stakeholder foods distinguishes itself uh, with its focus on 3D printing technology, tapping into a significant niche market. Uh, market niche rather. Now the competition extends beyond producing a realistic seafood alternative. It also encompasses the challenges of achieving sustainability, scalability, and cost effectiveness. And as the industry evolves, companies strive to create products that not only appeal to seafood enthusiasts, but also address environmental and ethical concerns associated with traditional seafood. So when I was writing this, I mean, the shrimp kind of to me has always been one of those foods that I never really thought could be emulated, um, either, uh, you know, plant based or uh, cultured, um, just because of the texture of it. It's got a very unique texture, um, you know, 
beef and chicken even are seem a little bit easier to emulate the texture of but shrimp always uh sort of i, I never really knew if it could be done um but if you look at you know the picture from stakeholder foods the main picture in in this article um i mean they also really really look like shrimp as well it's it's pretty impressive to me but um are you guys skeptical of you know uh, this this emulation. Do you think that they can truly capture the essence of uh, of a shrimp, uh, you know, printed with shrimp flavored ink? <laughs> I think only if you're not a big shrimp eater, maybe you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> but I think most people could tell. Mm. Yeah, but Sydney. Oh, I was just going to say that, like, based on the looks of it, it looks like they've done a pretty good job, at least um, from what, what I can see in the picture, to emulate, you know, the look of a shrimp. So I think they have something here. Um, yeah, when you said uh, flavor shrimp flavored ink, I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it just ties, I, I mean, I guess it's just like, obviously they're using, you know, flavorings and stuff, but um, when you think about well, not think about when, but when they do this kind of printing, um, even that to me, it's still like to wrap my head around like how they do this printing. It's just production essentially, I guess. But um, it's it's funny to me when it's like, oh, we're printing this 3D, 3D printing and then the ink with it. So the terminology, I guess, always kind of throws mm -hmm. me off with stuff like this. But yeah, I think um, I think they have something here. I'd be interested to try it. Um, and yeah, like I said, by the looks of it, I think uh, they've kind of, uh, they're kind of there with it. Yeah, and, and shrimp is one of those foods that has a much like more significant environmental yeah. impact than I think we realize, especially like shrimp farming um, can be quite, you know, harmful and unethical to the shrimp itself and there's such a high demand for mm -hmm. shrimp too like we we all love it it's <laughs> at least it all speak yeah. for myself i mean <laughs> i love shrimp people, yeah. and um yeah so this also brought up an interesting thought for me which is that you know people who's um who choose not to eat shellfish for one reason or the other whether they'd be willing to um eat this because it is plant-based um but it is you know while it's trying to emulate shrimp it's it's not shrimp so do you think that uh they would indulge in in something like this I think so. I mean, um, also allergies and things like that, right? People have so yeah, good point. So I think this would be a good, a great alternative, um, given that it's plant based. So mm -hmm. I don't see why people wouldn't um, want to try it. Uh, I think again for vegans, it's always uh, or vegetarians. That's always a tricky situation in terms of. Um, well, it comes down to personal preference and personal perspective in terms of why they don't eat meat in the first place. So um, if they have a plant-based alternative that looks like a shrimp in figure, you know, would they be comfortable eating that because it still looks like shrimp? I don't know. So uh, that's uh, a personal preference. But yeah, I think it definitely will open up, uh, a, um, you know, this is a great option that will definitely open up a lot of... Uh, uh, sort of, um, yeah, options and value to, to, to people um, across the board, so. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about um, seafood is, you know, growing concerns about like mercury levels yeah. and whatnot. So, um, you know, not just shrimp. I don't, I don't think it's really ever been like too big of a, I, I, I don't know what the stats are. I feel like you hear it more about like mm -hmm. salmon and, and tuna and, uh, you know, larger fish. But um I think that it's yet another reason to try to introduce these alternatives um, as well. And overfishing mm -hmm. is a problem. There's there's a whole host of problems that, that companies like this are trying to resolve. So um, this is just another one, and I'm quite impressed. All right, moving on to our next story. So Monster Beverage, the um, energy drink company, is taking another step in the alcoholic beverage space with its latest offering, Nasty Beast Hard Tea. Now, this drink boasts a 6% alcohol content and comes in four flavors, original, tea and lemonade, peach, and green tea. And its launch follows the 2022 debut of Beast Unleashed, marking Monster's bold expansion into the realm of alcoholic beverages. 
So Monster's Nasty Beast Hard Tea brings a novel combination of tea and alcohol to the market, minus the caffeine traditionally found in Monster's energy drinks. Now, uh, that is partially because I think there have been energy drinks mixed with alcohol in the past. Um, one example is Four Loco, um, and those beverages have been um, deemed illegal just because of how potentially dangerous they can be. So I think that is part of the reason why they took the caffeine away. Um, so Rodney C. Sachs, the company's chairman and co-CEO, said during a recent business update that he anticipates that Nasty Beast Hard Tea, along with Beast Unleash, will substantially boost Monster's presence on store shelves. And he highlights the strategic availability of these beverages in various formats, including four 24-ounce cans in convenience channels and multi-packs in larger retail stores. And the 12-ounce Nasty Beast Hard Tea is already heading to uh, store shelves with distribution already in progress. Plans are also in place for 24-ounce single-serve cans aiming to capture a larger market segment. Monster is leveraging its subsidiary, Canarchy Craft Brewery, which was acquired in January 2022 for $330 million for its distribution. So... Like I said, Monster is traditionally known for energy drinks, but it's also been a part of the alcoholic beverage market since 2022. The acquisition of Canarchy Craft Brewery, like I mentioned, marked this new direction, but this shift brings challenges. Co-CEO Hilton H. Uh, Schlossberg noted in the same business update potential financial impacts related to the Canarchy purchase amidst a broader slowdown in the craft beer industry. But despite these obstacles, Monster is determined to establish a strong presence in the alcoholic beverage sector using its extensive distribution networks and established brand reputation. And Monster's entry into um, this market prompts questions about strategies of its competitors, especially Red Bull and Rockstar. Luckily, though, for Monster, these energy drink giants have not significantly ventured into the alcohol market. While Red Bull has previously engaged in alcohol brand partnerships, it hasn't launched its own line of alcoholic beverages. And similar to Red Bull, Rockstar, which is now owned by PepsiCo, has not launched its own line of alcoholic beverages, but rather the brand remains focused on its non-alcoholic energy drink range. Monster's introduction of the Nasty Beast Hard Tea might inspire a new industry trend, and this move positions Monster as a pioneer, potentially influencing its rivals' future strategies and marking a notable expansion of its product portfolio beyond traditional energy drinks. Now, this launch represents more than a product line expansion. It signifies a redefinition of the company's brand identity. Tra uh, transitioning from um, a leader in energy drinks to a contender in the alcoholic beverage market showcases Monster's adaptability to market shifts and consumer preferences. It's facing a competitive market, but Monster's innovative approach and strong presence could pave the way for a successful venture. And the future of Nasty Beast Hard Tea, along with the Beast Unleashed line, will be crucial in determining Monster's ability to diversify and excel in new market domains. Now, the concept um, of, of um, like tea mixed with alcohol is certainly not a new one. Um, I know that there are several brands that um, sort of specialize in it, um, Twisted Tea being one of them. So that's another competitor, I guess, that I, I'm mentioning now. Um, but what do you make of, you know, Monster's foray into alcohol? Do you think that... Um, since they already have such a strong uh, brand identity um, and correlation with energy drinks that consumers will, um, you know, be eager to try like a, an alcoholic beverage from them? Or do you think that, you know, it's maybe a misstep? Well, I think they certainly have a customer base, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that, of course, not all monster energy drinkers are going to want to drink their alcoholic drink, right? I think... Mm -hmm. Um, at least the way alcohol is sold in Ontario, the province of Canada where we live, I think mostly people who walk into like, you know, a liquor store, they may see this new product. Maybe it's um, isolated somewhere on the shelves as like usually new products are and they may want to try it. But I, I think the majority of those people are going to be, you know, those uh, people who drink like I don't know ciders and other other hard teas as well. I don't think it's necessarily going to be like 
monster energy drinkers. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I think it's just going to be by convenience people who come across this new drink, whether mm-hmm. it was through marketing or you know in the in a liquor store. But I think um, yeah, I think they're just trying to diversify their product line and they're mm-hmm. trying to get those people who drink hard teas and who drink alcohol, but who may not necessarily drink energy drinks. So I think they mm-hmm. just want more people to buy from them. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think that it would be um, maybe confusing or maybe some people would assume that it's also it also contains caffeine and it's also an energy drink if they didn't know about, um, you know, the, the laws surrounding um, caffeine content with alcohol? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, it depends on the branding of their can, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think they're really going to, like, highlight caffeine-free anywhere in there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, my, that's my idea, you mm-hmm. know. I, I feel like they're just going to use their name, Monster, and use the name of this tea, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe somewhere in the back, in, in they'll mention this is caffeine-free or, mm-hmm. or something, But I don't think they're going to, like, highlight that it's caffeine-free. Now, you know, people should know better. They should know not to mix caffeine and alcohol. But, yeah, I think a lot of customers will buy it thinking there is caffeine. Yeah. Which, I don't know. I feel like that's a little bit of a little bit of an issue. But I'm sure they'll figure out there's no caffeine in it. I mean, you can just read the label. Um, But, yeah, I for sure would think that if I was buying this. Yeah, I think so too. Just the fact that it's like a tea and it doesn't even come to mind um, to me that it's like going to be potentially alcoholic, (laughs) like there's alcohol in it. Is that like a common thing where they have like these kinds of tea-based drinks that are alcoholic? Uh, yeah, I would say it's it's not the most mm-hmm. common, um, you know, ready to drink alcoholic beverage, but it certainly is um, has been growing okay. in recent years. I think anything that sort of can conceal the yep. taste of alcohol uh, <laughs> in a good way, and people love tea. Yeah. So um, yeah, so it's it's semi popular. Okay. I would say because uh, yeah. Um, so to me, this like just uh, looks first and foremost like any other kind of like an iced tea kind of a drink. So. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even know and then yeah if the, if it's like an iced tea thing then you would expect caffeine in it um but um and then you have the alcohol component but then you're it's like they you know it's caffeine free obviously so yeah it's a little bit again maybe I, I'm just not familiar with this but uh to to me it's a little bit um uncommon and i haven't it'd be kind of confusing to me but yeah i mean i think it's just another product to hit the shelves for monster um i don't know i feel like with a lot of these traditional or these major brands um their tried and tested formulas are the ones that keep them um going like uh so i when they when they tend to introduce new drinks and even new flavors i don't know i feel like they kind of um have like some initial hype and then they'll like kind of fizzle out like i feel like they don't Mm -hmm. stick around um because again it's like they're just so known for like a particular product or a, a couple of particular products that like um have such a strong consumer base and uh those are the ones that that stick and then the newer kind of experimentations that they do or the newer types of things that they might put out they don't catch on quite as um quite as uh as expected probably yeah i mean i i have to believe that after you know they released the beast unleashed two years ago um that they had a reasonable amount of success at least enough to release sort of a second product in this um you know in their alcoholic line um so and i think i think vera you're right they're just trying to sort of expand their um consumer base for maybe people that don't drink um energy drinks like myself um never have too scared um (laughs) but um yeah i mean we'll we'll see we'll see how well they do how well they'll compete with you know existing hard tea makers um but 
I recall the popularity of Beast Unleashed when it came out, so I wanted to cover this as well. Um, and yeah, we'll see how they do with, with their marketing. Yeah, if you like Google Nasty Beast Hearty, you can see a picture of their can and their ah. packaging. To mm-hmm. me, it like looks right away like an energy drink. Like I wouldn't think this is an alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it as yeah. well. I mean, the only thing, obviously, that gives it away is, well, that it's called a hard tea and that you can see that, you know, alcohol volume uh, percentage there at the bottom. But mm-hmm. you're, you know, with that imagery of sort of this eye thing coming out of uh something i don't know it kind of looks like a snake some kind of beast i suppose whatever yeah Yeah, (laughs) some type of a reptile but it's certainly aggressive (laughs) um and i think that (laughs) a lot of energy drink brands that's what they're going for so i totally agree with you vera it's it's a little bit hard to tell um I, i i guess just by um virtue of them being sold with other alcohol alcoholic products people would know i I guess that's the only the only thing i can say because yeah they they definitely look like energy drinks Mm -hmm. to me as well all right well that's the end of this episode of the x talks food podcast if you like today's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe thanks everyone and see you next week Bye. bye bye thanks for listening to the x talks food industry podcast If you enjoyed our discussions today, please share the episode with your friends and colleagues and be sure to subscribe in order to be notified when a new episode is released. To join in on the discussion, you can find X Talks on social media, email podcast at xtalks.com or comment on the articles directly. Links are in the show description. Take a moment to join our community at xtalks.com to get access to everything we have to offer, including webinars, job listings, virtual meetings, articles, and more. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the speakers sharing them. They should not be taken as professional advice and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position Honeycomb Worldwide. For further information, email us at podcast at xtalks.com. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week.